Come on, just lift up your hands all over the room and just begin to thank the Lord. We thank you that you're the answer, Jesus. You're the answer to every question. You are all sufficient. You know what you're doing. You hold the world in your hands. Come on, just continue to worship in your own way, in your own words, in your own song. We're just filling this room up with faith. We're just setting the atmosphere for miracles in this room. Come in your fullness, Spirit of God. just as you want it, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Come on, every eye on Jesus, every eye on Jesus, every heart lifted to him, every gaze fixed on him.
You know, right before we went into that last song, as we were in worship, just over the sanctuary, and I don't think it just means here, but it means right in your home. It was as if the Lord paraded, because anytime he comes, there's a parade, a parade of praise, a parade of glory. It's what Moses would say, Lord, would you show me your face? Show me your glory. He said, no one's ever seen me in my fullness and lived. But he hit him in the cleft of a rock. It says, as if he covered his face with a hand. As if to say, don't peek. But I have something I want to show you. And when the presence of God passed by, he released and he got to catch a glimpse of the entourage. The train. Everything that follows it. It was such an impact on Moses that even the glory of the Lord radiated from his face. And before we even went into that song, I had no idea they were going to sing that today. I just saw his train fill the temple. It's what Isaiah said, and the train of the Lord filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, with each having six wings. With two they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, with two they flew. And they said, holy, holy. Could you just take a moment? Understand in the train of what he did for us, there's healing, there's deliverance, there's freedom. There's sanity, there's clarity, there's discernment. If ever a day we need discernment, it is today. If ever a day we need to know that there is someone who has seen the beginning to the end. He's already seen everything in between. He has not flinched. He has not 
There, there's not one thing that has ever jolted him. He's not on a nerve pill. He's not freaking out. God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's, he never said you wouldn't go through things. He said, no, I'm going to take you through it. On the other end of it, I want you seeing what follows me. And so, Father, today we just declare healing in the name of Jesus. We pray the, fear, the back of fear would be broken because just one glimpse of your glory, just one touch of your hand. God, it's you we need. It's just you. Moses would even make that statement, and he said, if you don't go with us, we, I can't go. Because I just want you. I pray that that would be the call, the cry, the passion of everyone. That Lord, throughout all of the numbing that has gone on in our nation and around the world, I pray that deception would not settle in and that, Lord, we would have clarity, eyes to see, that you would open the eyes of our understanding. Lord, what do you want us to see? You just, Lord, to behold you in your beauty, to seek you in your sanctuary. Our focus, our gaze is on the beauty of you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Is anybody just thankful for the presence of God today? on our second reopening. Many people don't realize this because July, we, we typically take July, we were forced to take it off this year. And um, didn't realize that all of, except for Adam and Lindsay and little Rosalind, uh, nine of us were tested positive for COVID. And it hit this precious lady harder than any of us. And uh, so for three weeks, for 20 days, we were just quarantined, uh, taking care of each other, and just knowing, can I tell you something? The Father's faithful. He's faithful. We're not going to talk a lot, but if you want to greet everybody, we're not going to talk a lot about it today, but over the next couple of weeks, we're going to just do a sit down and let you know how God is faithful, and He is so faithful and I need you to know that <laughs> that yeah. we don't live in fear That's right. but I stood on a scripture and it's actually, actually an old song you've heard me when I speak a lot of times I talk about the songs I'd hear my mom sing when she was ironing that was back in the day when we started singing off the wall and out of the hymn books <laughs> in the old projectors where we would write the, the songs down but she, there was a song that they wrote to a scripture, and it says this, For I know who I have believed in, and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He's able, and we're not a people who live in fear. We are a people who live in hope. We live in hope. And it's what we've been singing about. And I just want to end with, with this. If you don't have a hunger for his presence, there's no way that you can live without fear. Because it's where you'll find him. When you find him in his presence, there's security. There's trust. Listen, he's already told us that there would be suffering, that there would be trials in this world. But if I cannot establish myself in an anchor to live that no matter what comes my way, I am not shaken. That's the God that we serve today. Amen. Come on, wherever you're at, can you give the Lord a clap of praise today? Yes. Yes. Well, I want to welcome you online, welcome you here in person. We are, uh, we've reopened the reopening, and um, we felt like that was the best thing to do this past month, but thank you for your faithfulness. Hey, would you just give someone an air high five? Would you do that? Even at home, go ahead, just slap, you've been wanting to slap somebody upside the head, go ahead and do that.
everybody doing this morning? It's good to see everybody this morning. Good to be with you at church at home as well, man. Such an honor to be in your house today, uh, being able to greet you right here from the Rock Family Worship Center. Hey, we want to do this. We want to welcome each and every one of you, especially our first-time guests today. If you're here for the very first time, you don't mind letting us know about it. Would you just wave at us if you're here? We recognize you. Yes, yes, yes. Wow, lots of visitors for the first time. Come on, church. If you're at home visiting, we see that hand. We don't see that hand. We can't see through television, but we... We do recognize that you're a visitor, and if you are a guest with us today, we encourage you, if you would just fill this out, you have this 77977, it's a text number there, and you put guest HSV. If you'll hit send uh, on that text message, it's actually a communication card that's going to be sent to you. We encourage you to take a minute to fill it out. It lets us know a little bit about you, how you found out about us, and again, gives us a chance to follow up with you and to say thank you personally. For being here. What an honor to have you here today. I'm telling you what, it's going to be a great day today. We've got a lot of great things. Can I also say this for those who were partnering with us over this weekend with Impact 256, huge success. Pastor Chris, the Dream Center, and all of those who served this weekend, a massive kudos to you guys. Thank you for taking the time to serve our city. Amen. Come on, can I tell you, there's a, there's a great need to bring hope in the city. Amen. Okay. Okay, we're full of hope in here already. We don't need any more hope, evidently. So it's a great need for us to do it. And, man, we appreciate all of the effort, all of the school supplies, all the things that you did to make that happen. Thank you for doing that today. Hey, listen, it's offering time we get to give. Amen? Oh, it's awesome. Yeah, we clap here because we don't give out of a sob story. We give. We don't give out of obligation. We give out of service and love and worship. It's worship. It's an extension of our worship where we get to say to the Lord, we trust you with every area of our life. If you'd like to give, we're doing that online. Uh, today, you can do that real simply. You see it on the screen here, Rock HSV 77977. When you hit send for that text message, uh, that'll actually link you to our app, a safe and secure way for you to give. And uh, if you're online today, you're watching online, you can simply go to our website, go to the give uh, in the drop-down menu, and it, it'll take you to the same place. If you came prepared to give uh, at tithes and offerings today in the physical sense, if you're here today and you'd like to do that on your way out today as we exit, we have boxes in the back. You can drop that in or buckets here for those who will be exiting out the front end. We'll remind you of that at the end of service, but there's an opportunity for you to give as well. We appreciate you guys taking the time to be with us today. Can we do something real quick? I've got to do this. Pastor Rusty's about to come, but we got to honor Pastor Rusty and Lisa this morning, and uh, we just want to say to you, come here, Pastor Rusty. Come on out here. If Pastor Lisa's around, where is she here? There you are, Pastor Lisa. Uh, you probably know this already, but we're going to go ahead and say it anyway, but these people deserve a little honor today, not just because you survived COVID, hallelujah. Hey, that, that deserves a lot of, but listen, it is our 21st anniversary of the church, the Rock Family Worship Center, and you guys are an amazing, amazing couple. Come on, you can do much, much better for pastors of 21 years. If you're online, you need to stand up in your home, shout, scream, let them know. For all of our campuses who are joining us, we welcome you. We thank you for joining in today. You need to stand up and let them know how much you love and appreciate you. Thank you so much for all that you do, all that you've done, all that you've invested in. Look, all of this. And there's so much more. I, I can't even express how many lives are going to be directly linked to your impact and your influence and your obedience. And uh, we are just a few of the many, many, many who will stand before the Lord and say, if there was a couple, there was this crazy couple that decided to do something wild in Huntsville, and it changed our lives forever. And we are indebted to you. We thank you. We thank you for letting God use you the way he has. Do you love Pastor Rusty and Lisa this morning? Aren't they amazing? Aren't they amazing? Pastor Rusty, we love you. It's all yours, man. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, man, I, I tell you, after you come through this past month, I, it, it hit me this morning. Wow, today is the 21st anniversary. You know when you're 21, you can go deeper in the spirit now. So let's do that, I, I guess. I, in his spirit, that's, that's the one. But we are, thank you. And it is so wonderful. Could you give it up for all of our campuses today, including Church at Home, but Madison, Fayetteville, Smith Lake Shoals, you guys are reopening today, and we love you. And uh, to all of our pastors, Pastors Pat and Kim, and, and thank you, Drew and Dee, and uh, Brian and Suzanne, you're amazing. And, and everything that in Fayetteville, 
and God is, is getting ready to, you know, we're transitioning pastors there, and God's providing and going to provide the man and woman of God for there. But we love you today, and uh, for all those joining online, it is an honor on this day to have, I don't think he's a special guest, I just think he's an amazing general in the body of Christ, and he's someone that, uh, you know, is the founder of National Institute of Christian Leadership, which is actually in two weeks, we were going to begin a three-month leadership institute here at our campus. We have moved it to next year, to 2021, and I'd already, he had already said yes to be here for August 4th or August 2nd, and I said, please, Dr. Rutland, please still come. Uh, he's also Global Servants, which is a missions organization that was founded many years ago, uh, just touching and preaching the gospel around the, the globe and how God has used this amazing man of God, how he's used him in mine and Lisa's life. We are graduates of this institution and uh, the leadership training that we get. And uh, he is a gift to the body of Christ. He's a gift to this church. And so I'm honored today. And actually, Dr. Rutland, right before you come, I would you please join me? Would you give it up for Dr. Mark Rutland as he comes to join me? Come here. I want to I want to present you with something today. I guess we do this. Uh, I guess we can do that. <laughs> we are so honored that you are with us today. But I want, before you take the podium, I want to give you a gift today. Because your writings, and you're going to talk about a couple of your books today. Your writings outlive you. We don't want you going anywhere. But they have been a historical account of the revelation God has given you. And that, and, and so there's a friend of mine who God is, is amazing. His name is Ray Hughes. Ray lathes pins. And God has blessed him to be able to get lumber or wood from very key locations, from the Red River Revival to Cane Ridge Revival many other places of trees that were there. But this wood was lathed actually from the window panes of Dr. Billy Graham's home he was raised in. And because you take the past and you write the future, we want to give you a special gift today and say thank you for pinning what God has placed in you. And our lives will forever be this never be the same. So I want to give that to you today and say thank you. Would you please welcome Dr. Mark Rutland one more time. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for that lovely gift. Uh, I, Pastor probably doesn't know this. I have something of a collection of pens. And uh, so uh, this will be a wonderful addition to it, especially uh, as it came from Billy Graham's uh, home. I, I, uh, I will treasure that. Thank you. Well, congratulations on 21 years. Lisa was only eight when she came here. And <laughs> it's, it's amazing, really, what she's accomplished. And, and Rusty's done a good job, too. <laughs> I know that you are grateful for this couple. Uh, the city of Huntsville is, and the kingdom has been blessed and enriched by their leadership in their ministry, as I have been by their friendship. And I'm, I'm grateful for the invitation to be here on this anniversary. I want to, uh, I can't see all the people in the other campuses, but, but I, I, we, we can hear it in here. So uh, I want all the people at Madison, if you will, when I say three, if you'll cheer real loud. Nobody in here, just the people at Madison. Are you ready? One, two, three. Well, that was pretty good. That was, that was good. But let's see if Fayetteville, I believe Fayetteville, they've always been loud at Fayetteville. So if you'll, let's hear one, two, three, Fayetteville. Wow, that was, that was better. People are quiet at Shoals. I don't know if they can do it or not. We'll try Shoals now. You ready? One, two, three, Shoals. Man. And Smith Lake, one, two, three, Boy, those campuses are loud. Now you're home watching on your online campus, scattered from Dan to Beersheba, not only just this campus, but you got people that are watching in Afghanistan and everywhere else. So right there, wherever you are in your house 
or wherever you are in a hotel, are you ready? One, two, three, give a good cheer for God. Now we'll see how we can do right here in this house. One, two, three, give a good cheer for God. Amen. Amen. You're a lively crew. Um, as you go out, there are books that are, are for sale in the, in the lobby. Uh, and thank you for the wonderful endorsement from Pastor. Uh, I only brought three uh, of the books, so uh, three titles. There are multiple copies, of course, but I only brought three titles. I want to just mention these three to you. This is the book on the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm, which I wrote. It's called 21 Seconds to Change Your World. It's been a tremendous seller for us. It still continues to sell. I'm very grateful for this book and what it's meant to so many people. And then the second was uh, a book that I actually preached on here, David the Great. And uh, this book has been a huge seller. I hope that you will get it if you haven't already. This book has been uh, the anomaly in Christian books. Christian booksellers and publishers and all will tell you who reads Christian books are women. It's very difficult to write and find a book that men will read. This book has been a huge hit with men. And, and why not? David was a man's man. He was a warrior's warrior. And uh, this is, David was the kind of guy you want to take deer hunting. You probably don't want him to take your wife deer hunting. But <laughs> this deals with the real King David. This is not your sanitized Sunday school version. This is, this is the real guy with his ups, his downs, his pluses, his minuses. David the Great, I hope that you would get it, get it for the men in your life, ladies, and you read it. And then this is the brand new book that just came out in January. We're thrilled. This book has exploded. It's sold faster in a shorter period of time than any book I've ever written. I'm not going to speak on it today. I, I feel like the Lord has given me something just for today. Um, but this is called Courage to be Healed. It's a book about inner healing, the healing of damaged emotions, and it's readable. It's easy. This is not a, a psychology manual. It's about inner healing and finding the courage to be healed. I hope that you'll get it and enjoy it, that it'll be a blessing to you. This is the first book I've written where people buy multiple copies. They don't just buy one or two. They buy many because they think of other people in-laws or friends or relatives or neighbors, and they think, oh, I wish they'd read that book. I wish they'd read that book. So there, they will tell you all kinds of deals that you can get to get the books in multiple copies. I hope you'll get them all. This probably doesn't matter to you to hear it. It matters to me to say it. I do not take one penny from the sale of these books or from speaking here or anywhere I go. I receive a very generous salary as the president uh, an executive director of the National Institute of Christian Leadership, and my arrangement with them is that I will not take any other remuneration from ministry. So all that book royalties are not even paid to me, book sales, anything, speaking engagements, love offerings, everything, it all goes 100% to the foreign missions program of Global Servants, particularly to our girls' homes in Ghana, in West Africa, and Thailand in Southeast Asia. So I hope you'll go out there to the book table and spend yourself into bankruptcy. <laughs> Mortgage your house. Spend the children's lunch money. Come on. <laughs> All right, if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to take those and turn, if you will, to the book of Judges. going to read three passages of scripture, just three verses from three different books. As I read these, you may think to yourself, I don't know how in the world these are going to connect. I hope that by the end of the, of the sermon you will. I'm, I'm also going to deal with some historical things, but, uh, but I, I urge you, I invite you to stay with me. I, I believe God has a word for us this morning, something a bit unique. I want to speak this morning on the God of the unlikely, and I, I'm going to deal with some, some historical things, but it's not a mere history lesson, a lecture. I, I'm, I'm going to, it's going to lead somewhere, but if you'll, so if you'll just stay with me, I'd appreciate it. So the first passage is Judges chapter 21, 
the very last verse of the book of Judges. Chapter 21, verse 25, the last verse of the book of Judges. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, just in passing, let me say, that is not a positive verse of Scripture. To, to Americans, with our, our view of the republic and all, royalty is abhorrent to us. And so, therefore, when we say there's no king, we say, with something we say in America, we have no king but Jesus. However, that's not a positive verse of Scripture. What it means is this, there was no presiding ethos in the country. There was no, there was no sense of a unified set of values that, that the, the, the nation's ethics, morals, spirituality were crumbling into a, into a morass of individual ethics. And the book of Judges ends, ends in, in a morass. Now, if you'll just turn the page, if you will, to the book of Ruth, the first chapter and the fourth verse. And they, now that is the sons of Naomi. So let me just give you a little background. Naomi and her husband and their two sons have left a famine in the village of Bethlehem in, in Israel. They've gone across the Jordan River to Moab where they prosper to a certain extent. And her sons marry Gentile girls, not the dream of a Jewish mother. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. Now, if you will, just turn a few pages to 1 Samuel, chapter 1 and verse 20. 1 Samuel 1 and 20. Wherefore it came to pass... When the time was come, when the time was come about, after Hannah had conceived, that she bore a son and called his name Samuel, because I have asked him of the Lord. Now put your hand on your Bible, if you will, and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, with our hand upon the word, our hearts and minds as open as we know how to get them, we're asking you to do all the rest. Brush aside all of our carefully constructed mechanisms of self-defense. Naked before you, that we may hear from you deep within. That when we leave here today, we will say one to another, surely the Lord has spoken unto us. In the mighty name Jesus, the strong Son of God, amen. A man named Roy Sullivan was a national park ranger in the Shenandoah National Park in Virginia. He was struck by lightning seven times. How unlikely is that? Does not make me want to visit the Shenandoah National Park. I don't know that it's causational, but there is a sad ending to Roy Sullivan's story. He committed suicide in 1983. I don't know what being struck by lightning seven times had to do with that. But he was, how unlikely, the same man in the same park struck by lightning seven times. In 1954, here in Alabama, a woman named Ann Hodges was lying on her couch when a black rock shot through the ceiling and hit her in the hip. They took it to the University of Alabama and analyzed it and it was a meteorite. They say that it is so unlikely that a human being would be struck by a meteorite that it would likely happen only once in every 9,000 years. How unlikely is that? On the other hand, if anybody had told me that would happen, I think I would have guessed it would happen in Alabama. <laughs> Husband and wife in Belmont, California in 2002 won two lotteries on the same day. They won $126,000 in Fantasy Five and $17 million in Super Lotto Plus. People who reckon odds on that sort of thing and will have to take their word for it. They say the odds against that happening are one in 24 trillion. However, 
These are just random incidents of long odds events. As I read the Bible, and as I observe, I'm neither a prophet nor the child of a prophet, but as I observe the, the movement of God in history, and as I can read it in his word, it seems evident to me, obvious to me, that God is a God of the unlikely. He seems, it seems to me that he wants to move through, through unlikely times, using unlikely instruments to accomplish unlikely ends. In Judges chapter 21, verse 25, the passage with which we began, there are two stories at the end of the book of Judges that are so gritty. I won't go into them, but they're just, they're so horrible. You just think to yourself, why, why are you including this in your word, Lord? Why, why do we want to hear this? The book of Judges has these great champions, Gideon and Samson and Jephthah and Barak and Deborah. And then the book just kind of oozes out into a muddy delta. And it, it feels like the... The book is just collapses at the end, folds in on itself, and, and ends with these two horrible stories, and then this statement, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. But at the end of the book of Judges, there, the book of Judges and the book of Ruth are happening at the same time. So it, the book of Judges is an end, and then the book of Ruth starts. They are coincidental. So during the season of the judges, Naomi and her husband and their two sons leave Israel and go to Moab to flee a famine. They prosper there for a season. And during that time, the boys marry Gentile girls. Then the famine hits Moab. The husband dies. Now Naomi is a widow. Then her two sons die. Now she is bereft, no one to care for her. She releases her Gentile daughters and says, look, I release you. Go back, go to your families. I'm going back to Israel. The one Orpah says, fine, and she goes. The other, Ruth, you know the story of Ruth, and she said, makes this famous speech to her mother-in-law. Whither thou goest, I will go. Whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. Thy God shall be my God. I've done weddings where the bride and groom said that to each other. That's, that's not biblical. You want to use that passage in a wedding, let the bride turn around and say it to her mother-in-law. See how that works. <laughs> so Naomi returns to her village of Bethlehem with nothing, worse than nothing. She's a widow. Both her sons are dead, and she's got this Gentile daughter-in-law stuck to the bottom of her shoe like bubble gum. And yet, it is through this girl, Ruth, that the, that the long-term plan of God toward raising up a Messiah in, to the world is carried forward through the DNA of this girl. And through her, also King David. Four generations from Ruth to King David. And from David a thousand years to Jesus. All of that happens in this little village of Bethlehem. But when, when Naomi returns with nothing besides a Gentile daughter-in-law, she's bitter and angry. She even changes her name. Naomi in Hebrew means full, as in full of blessings. Not full like I've just eaten, but full of blessings. And she says, no, don't even call me Naomi anymore. When I left here, I was Naomi. Now I'm Mera. My run Hebrew means bitter, poison. Now she says, I'm nothing but an angry, toxic old widow with a Gentile daughter-in-law. And out of that unlikely scenario comes the greatest king in Israeli history and the Messiah of the nations, the God of the unlikely. And then comes this passage from 1 Samuel. The nation is in disarray. The priesthood is corrupt. 
Eli's sons, who are the, his successors into the priesthood, are corrupt. God says, I, I need someone that can speak prophetically to this generation. Where will I find him? And there's a woman who is barren and in a polygamous household whose sister wife mocks her for her barrenness. And she goes to the tabernacle rocking back and forth and praying with such passion that the high priest accuses her of being stoned. That's a pretty unlikely moment. And God says, that's what I'm looking for. And out of her barren womb, the prophet Samuel. God is the God of the unlikely. Let me give you some historical evidence of it as well. Sometimes we think God only operated in the Bible. And that he isn't doing anything in, in life, in history. Here's an unlikely time. 1738, the nation of England was being besieged, swamped, really destroyed by what was called the gin craze. When, you know, the alcoholic beverage gin, but people don't realize what, what it was. It was a cheap drink for an impoverished people. The nation of England in 1738 was filled with poverty and despair. And so this cheap drink, gin, hit England like, like a, a, a drug craze of today. And, and it is still called, you can Google it up sometime, the gin craze. It was so ubiquitous that they say that every man, woman, child in the nation, the average consumption of gin a year was 2.2 gallons per person. In London alone, there were 7,000 gin bars. Look up and Hutchison tell us that the most common street sign in London in 1738 was get drunk here for a penny. 7,000 gin mills in London alone. At that time, the population of London was only 650,000. That means a gin bar for every 92 people, men, women, babies, everything in the whole city. I did the math on that. And before you trust my math, you might want to check with some of my arithmetic teachers from elementary school. But I did the math on that. There are about 6 million people in metropolitan Atlanta. And if that same ratio carried forward, it would mean that there would have to be 65,217 crack houses in downtown Atlanta. I don't know how many there are, but they're not 65,000. It was an unlikely time for anything to happen good in England. Because of that addiction to gin, robbery, prostitution, disease was rampant, and child sex traffic was exploding. An unlikely time for anything very good to happen. Come a little bit further in history and come to the United States. Post-Revolutionary War, United States, 1798. The Revolutionary War had been won, but the, the American frontier was was degenerating. And when I talk about the frontier, the Wild West in 1798 was not Arizona, it was Tennessee and Kentucky. The Wild West was falling to pieces. The roads were highly dangerous. Highway robbery was a way of life in 1798 American frontier. Alcoholism, avaricious land grabbing. The people were being chewed up like bread. Violence vast sexual promiscuity and robbery. It was an unlikely time for anything very good to happen. Well, let's come a little closer. There may not be very many people here that will remember it, but I certainly remember the summer of love, 1967. If you're going to San Francisco, be sure to wear some flowers in your hair because you're going to meet some loving people there, the summer of love, 1967. Haight-Ashbury District of San Francisco, so my generation, we went out to San Francisco to find the summer of love, but we didn't find the summer of love. We found the Zodiac Killer and veteran pimps who made prostitutes and streetwalkers out of little girls from Iowa and Indiana. And we invented a disease called AIDS. And it was a, it was a drug-addicted collapse. 
unlikely time for anything very good to happen. In unlikely times, God chooses unlikely instruments. 1738 in England, God looked into what was happening and the gin craze and the violence and the prostitution and the, the, the addiction. A whole nation collapsing. Think of it. A, a, gin, a gin bar for every 92 people in the, in the city. It was collapsing. Deep division between the upper crust and the, and the, morad, the mass of people. God said, I need an instrument. I need someone that can be the spark to bring revival and transform this culture. So there's a little Anglican priest named John Wesley. Five foot six inches tall. God, I love knowing that. <laughs> uh, it hurts me when you laugh at me. <laughs> he wants to, he graduates from Oxford. He wants to serve God. He wants to be sacrificial. He wants to do the hardest thing. What's the hardest thing in the world? Be a missionary to the Indians. Where's the worst place in the world that he could go? Georgia. People in Alabama still agree with that. <laughs> so he came to Savannah to be a missionary to the Indians. He never saw an Indian. They made him a parish priest in the town of Savannah, and he messed it up so badly that he was sued for libel, threatened with arrest, had to flee through the swamp at night to his brother Charles, who was General Oglethorpe's private secretary. And General Oglethorpe and Charles put him on a ship back to England, a failed, discouraged, and deeply depressed missionary with his tail between his legs. And he wrote in his diary, I went to America to save the Indians, but oh, who will save me? And God said, that's my man. That's exactly what I'm looking for. A little short man with a high-pitched, irritating nasal voice who has failed at the only ministry undertaking of his whole life. Just the ticket. That's the guy I need. John Wesley attended. He spoke German. John Wesley spoke German as well as English because he was a great scholar. He attended a prayer meeting of German Moravians in Aldersgate Street in London where he heard Luther's preface to the book of Romans being let, read in German. Don't you know that was spine-tingling stuff? <laughs> but Wesley wrote, I felt my heart being strangely warmed. And the Wesleyan revival burst into flame in England. It leapt the oceans and leapt the continents. The frontier of America was impacted by the Wesleyan revival from India and Africa. The Wesleyan revival was a worldwide revival that began in the heart of a failed missionary. It's an unlikely moment and an unlikely instrument and unlikely results. 17. 1798 in the wilderness of Tennessee and Kentucky. God said, I, I, I need an instrument that will go into the frontier and maybe I should choose some great pastor from Boston or New York or Philadelphia, someone with education and, and power and anointing so that there'll be some man who can travel the frontier and bring revival. God said, no, no, there are little tiny churches in unknown villages with exciting names. Let me give you three. Muddy River. Here's one I like. Clay Lick. I know revival's going to start there. Or Cane Ridge. And God hit with a revival so powerful that some of the largest gatherings in American history up to that time happened in the wilderness. But no, there's no internet to call people out there. How did they know about it? How did they hear about it? How did they get 20,000 people a night gathered in Cane Ridge? The unlikely instrument, little tiny churches in faraway places brought about an awakening. 1967, Haight-Ashbury. God looked and said, I need, I need an instrument. 
I need an instrument. I need something, someone that can turn this thing. And he looked at the, the hippies, dirty, barefooted, discouraged, rebellious, who had left their parents' prosperity and gone to hate ashbury and found nothing but drug addiction and wickedness, bondage. And God said, there's my instrument. I'll use the hippies. And when the hippies wore out on drugs and rebellion, they turned to Jesus. And one of the first great moves of God in the late 1960s was the Jesus people. And the Jesus people gave birth to the charismatic renewal movement, of which I am a child. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in 1975, not in a great Pentecostal church like this, but, a, but in a meeting of 120 Methodist preachers that were discouraged and defeated and didn't know what to do with life or with ministry. And the power of the Holy Spirit fell on us, a direct descendant of dirty, barefoot, bell-bottom, rebellious hippies. God said, that's my instrument. Sometimes I have this image, and I, I, I know it's a dreadful anthropomorphism and maybe borderline heresy, but I have this image of God standing on the parapet of heaven, looking at humanity and saying, I, I think I'll choose that time. I'm going to choose that person right there. And I had this image of the angels standing behind him. And when God announces his choice, they go, yeah, yeah, that's, mm, that's good, Lord. <laughs> the height of the gin craze, 1738 in England. And he says, this is the perfect time for a revival. And the angels say, yeah, that's, that's what we were all thinking. <laughs> Whom shall I choose? the pastor of some great Anglican church in London, the, the Archbishop of Canterbury. No, a failed missionary who's on the verge of suicide. And the angel said, yeah. Mmm. <laughs> what does it mean to us? What does it mean to us? Look at the age in which we live. Division, anger, hurt, bitterness, plague, the like of which I, I've never seen. I'm probably the oldest person in the room. I never, I never saw anything like what we're going through. We can't touch each other. Pastors in isolation, not even because of sin. <laughs> and all the, all the riots and the hurt and the hate and the bitterness. See, I got to tell you, this feels like a pretty unlikely time for anything very good. This is about as likely as a meteorite hitting a woman on a couch in Alabama. And God says, perfect. This is the moment I've been waiting on. Whom shall we send? Who will go for us? And God looks into some KKK camp in the boondocks where some semi-literate, ignorant redneck is shooting an AK-47 at a target picture of Nelson Mandela, and God says, there's my man to preach racial reconciliation and national justice. That's just the guy I've been looking for. And the angels say, hmm. Good choice, oh Lord. So now I need someone to speak to the nation about respect and, and honor for authority and revival, holiness of heart and life. And he looks into, the, into a boiling city filled with flame and anger, and there's some Antifa thug beating a cop with his skateboard, and God says, There, there's a man. That's who I'm going to use. I, I'm not prophesying these things. I'm not predicting them. I'm just saying that I can track the footsteps of God through human history, and I'm saying as unlikely as those things are makes them seem likely to me. You see, God is not shaken by human history. 
If you think God's picking up the New York Times every morning to find out what's going on, whoa, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> a, he's not reading a newspaper, and B, if he is, it isn't the Times. God is not shaken. History is not happening to God. God. God is not only the God of human history. This is what we forget. He is God in human history. I can't think in my lifetime. I can't think of a less likely time for an authentic move of God than the one in which we live. A less likely morning than this very morning. All the tension, fear, and anxiety. Half the nation terrified that this person is going to get elected. The other half of the nation equally terrified that the other person is going to get elected. Division, hurt, anger, bitterness, resentment, and fear on every corner. Afraid to touch each other or open our mouths in public. And God said, this is what I've been waiting on. An unlikely time. What? What? What does it mean to us? Some of you, not, not because I know you, but in a crowd of this size, some of you have some in-law that's been drunk as Cooter Brown for 45 years. <laughs> Just stoned out of his skull, his liver, the shape and form and the hardness of a baseball. And you're thinking to yourself, I just... I don't think it's likely that he's ever going to come to God. Perfect. That's the moment. God loves unlikely moments like that. Some of you dealing with things in your own lives. And you just say, I just, it seems unlikely this marriage can be saved. It seems unlikely that our wayward child will come home. It just, it just seems unlikely for for the finances, for our finances to ever be turned around, remember that God is the God of the unlikely. He loves just such moments. And he chooses just such instruments. And then we reduce that down to the likes of us. What about us? I'm, I'm not talking us corporately. I mean us, you, me. There may be somebody in your life, somebody you've never met, somebody that is pumping gas at the gas station next to you, and the more unlikely encounter for the kingdom of God and the glory of Christ can hardly be imagined than you and that person. And you look at that person and there's something about them, something about the way they dress or their race or their, their something, and you just... Think to yourself, maybe I ought to talk. To, maybe, maybe I ought to talk to them. And then you think, no, that's unlikely. This sermon has ruined that for you. <laughs> you <laughs> don't you see? I've wrecked that. You'd be standing there thinking, well, maybe I ought to talk to them. Unlikely. <laughs> you say, oh, no. <laughs> don't you see? You may very well be the unlikely instrument of God in somebody's life. Think to yourself, who am I? <laughs> who, who am I that I could be used? God said, I need someone to go down into Egypt and tell a Pharaoh to let my people go. The angel said, Lord, who will you choose? He said, well, I've got my eye on a guy. He's an 80-year-old man living in the backside of the Midianite desert for 40 years. And he, he's, last time he left Egypt, he left because there was a price on his head for voluntary manslaughter. And the angel said, mmm, mmm. God spoke to Moses and said, Moses, you're my choice. Moses said, all right, I, I feel that's unlikely, but I'll go. I'll go, but he said, I need, I need something, an instrument, a, a flaming sword, something as a, as a symbol of, of your authority and power. And God said, what's that in your hand? Moses said, 
stick. See, Lord, it's, it's a stick. God said, perfect. The 80-year-old felon with a stick in his hand, that's the instrument. It'll bring down the Egyptian empire, free the slaves, found the nation of Israel, and drown an army. <laughs> that's pretty unlikely. God looked at the first century church and he said, I keep trying to tell them to move beyond the sectarianism of religion, to get out of Jerusalem and go into the Gentile world. And they won't listen to me. So I've got to have somebody that will take the gospel of salvation by faith, the grace of my, of my wisdom and love for the Gentile nations that will take it all over the Mediterranean, the Greco-Roman world. The angel said, Lord, who will you choose? He said, well, there's this guy that hates the church. He's responsible for the death of the first Christian martyr, and he's on his way to Syria right now with letters from the chief priest to arrest the Hebrew Christians that are there and bring them back to Jerusalem in chains. <laughs> the angel said, you, Yo, that's who we were thinking. And Saul of Tarsus becomes St. Paul. Just after the turn of the last century, and the 19th yielded to the 20th, God said, I'm ready to bring a great revival of spirit-filled thinking and living, a plunge of the church into the realm of the supernatural. Whom shall I choose? Who will go for us? God sent an illiterate, one-eyed black man William Seymour, where do I send him? Where's a city likely to burst into evangelistic and Pentecostal revival? Los Angeles. But still seriously unlikely. And so William Seymour, with a Bible under his arm that he couldn't even read, found an abandoned livery stable that had been had been a, an African Methodist Episcopal church and had been abandoned and turned into a livery stable and now had been abandoned. And he bought that livery stable and cleaned it up down on Azusa Street in Los Angeles. Today, there are 279 million classical Pentecostals and 305 million Charismatics, 580 million worldwide spirit-filled Christians from a one-eyed black man who was illiterate, an unlikely instrument in an unlikely time. God is not finished. God is not frightened. God is not quarantined. God is not quarantined. He's in this. And as unlikely as this seems, actually makes me think this may be the moment. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes all over the house? Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll take this simple little message and massage it deep within us. Where there was despair, give us hope. Let your perfect love cast out all of our fear. Where we were filled with apprehension, give us excitement to see your hand outstretched in this nation and in this world. Come, Holy Spirit. Now, right where you are with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'd like to urge you to just pray aloud for a moment, not shouting or screaming, but just begin to open your mouth and say, Great is the Lord. Speak it. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. And greatly to be praised. Great is the Lord. Say it out loud. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Look right up here. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to stand, to be, stand us before his presence without fault and with unspeakable joy. 
to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and authority before time began throughout human history, even now and throughout all the ages to come. And when the battle's over, we'll all wear a crown. God bless you and God bless this great church. today, man. Sir, that was one of the greatest anniversary gifts we could have ever received. Because I'm telling you, God's not finished. He is the one who begins. He is the one who begins again and lets us walk. And my, how many just want to be one of those instruments. You say, you don't know where I came from. And it's not about where you came from. It's about who you came to. That's all, that's, that's all that matters is who we came to. You know, if you're watching online today and you, you just need Jesus, there are people who will, there that are engaging with you on, on social media live. And you can surrender your life to him today. In this room, you can. But to understand there's no such thing as an insignificant seed. It was never the seed issue. It was always the soil. And if you'll just receive the seed of his word today, it will give much fruit, his fruit in our lives. We love you today. Would you stand with me here in the audience? And if you're, if you're watching online, if you're at other campuses, I know our pastors are about to take this service. But just know today, We've been brought, I know it sounds so cliche but we've been brought to his kingdom for such a time as this. I can't wait to see what he does out of this. I said again, I can't wait to see all God does from this. And I just don't want to miss it. I want to keep my eyes on him. And there have been many opportunities that the enemy would try to distract from that. But he's our goal. He's our source. He's our strength. He's the one, and I said earlier, we live, we move, we have our being. And so I'm so thankful, Dr. Rutland. His books are in the commons area for you that are in the auditorium. But I do want you to know that if you're watching online, that link, you can go directly to the link of their ministry, and you can order book after book. And it is, it is from the source of God placing through the life of this man of God. And I encourage you to do that, especially this new book. I believe it's going to be a blessing, Courage to be Healed. I said, Dr. Rutland, what the timing of this. He almost didn't release this book. And uh, just because people urged him, please, it's a needful moment. And had no idea that, that we would be living where we are right now. So can I encourage you to do that, whether it be online or whether it be in here today. I know we're, we've got to vacate this uh, auditorium so that we can get it sanitized for the next group that is coming in. Thank you for being the first, or, or be the second of the first today. And I invite you, listen, we have, we've done everything to keep this place sanitized, to make it safe and secure for you. Come and join us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you. Be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you, give you peace, write his name on you and say, you belong to me. I pray the blessing of God over you today. Have a Jesus-filled week. God bless you. Pastor Scott, come. He's going to lead us out, and you'll know how to.